Thank you, Mayor Menino, for that very kind and gracious introduction. Thank all of you for your very warm welcome. Mayor Menino, Dr. Charles Jacobs, President of the American Anti-Slavery Group, and recipient of the Boston Freedom Award for 2000, Boston 2000 President, Mr. Michael Taylor, and to our honoree this evening, a special person this evening, I think, a person who has endured slavery, Mr. Francis Bob. And to all of you who have come this evening in support of this tremendous effort, I want to say uh, what a great pleasure and honor it is for me to be here this evening and to address this first annual Boston Freedom Awards dinner. And I want to thank you, Mayor Menino and President Michael Taylor for inviting me to be your speaker for this evening. It always feels like a bit of a homecoming for me to be back in Boston. Since I lived here, while attending the New England Conservatory of Music between 1951 and 54, and Boston is where, as you know, I met Martin Luther King Jr., and we began our lives together here. I have very wonderful and warm memories of my stay here in Boston. And I met uh, many friends that have continued to have relationships over the years. As an advocate of nonviolence, this building, the Old South Meeting House, is a place of pilgrimage for me. For it was within these walls that the planning began for some of America's earliest and most powerful nonviolent actions, including the Boston Tea Party and the boycott of British tea. Also, I recall that Phyllis Wheatley and Benjamin Franklin worshipped here, and the rafters of this historic sanctuary have trembled with a fervor oratory of some of America's greatest leaders. There is so much meaningful history in Boston. Not only were many of the seeds of the American Revolution sown here, but for African Americans, it holds a special place in our hearts as a wellspring of the river of hope that history calls the abolitionist movement. William Lord Garrison, Wendell Phillips, and other great abolitionists called Boston home. And America's most eloquent abolitionist, Frederick Douglass himself, called Boston the hotbed of abolitionism. This is a very proud heritage. I think it is fair to say that at a time when the cruelty and brutality of slavery was defended by the overwhelming majority of America's political leaders, Boston, more than any other city, nurtured and gave refuge to the visionary abolitionists who struggled and sacrificed unceasingly to make democracy a reality for Americans of every race. And I commend to you Mayor Manino and the Boston 2000 for your leadership and preserving that precious heritage and bringing it to life for the benefit of future generations. And so it seems beautifully appropriate that today in this historic city and sanctuary we honor the ongoing struggle against slavery in our times. 
and those who carry on the abolitionist struggle in the spirit of Douglas, Mott, Garrison, Phillips, Tottenham, and others who graced our nation with their incorruptible passion for social justice and human decency. I do appreciate your vision and dedication, Dr. Jacobs, and I salute the great work of the American anti-slavery group. I heartily applaud your steadfast advocacy in behalf of the estimated 27 million people who continue to live under modern forms of slavery. I understand why the American anti-slavery group is focusing on the issue of slavery in Mauritania and the Sudan because these nations support particularly blatant and brutal forms of slavery and even genocide. And it is good that you have acknowledged that different forms of slavery oppress even greater numbers in India and other nations in Asia. I would also appeal to you, however, to help address other unfinished business concerning slavery in Africa. In addition to the enslavement of Sudanese and Mauritanians, nearly all of sub-Saharan Africa is being held in bondage to the demands of servicing an unpayable debt of more than $350 billion. It is estimated that servicing that debt consumes as much as 40% of the annual budget of 42 African nations. This form of bondage may not be as dramatic as that which is being experienced in Sudan and Mauritania, but the misery it leaves in its wake has created massive, horrific human suffering, which can no longer be ignored by any nation that prides itself in freedom and justice. As a result of Africa's death burden, millions of children have died of preventable and treatable illnesses. Millions more have died as a result of dehydration that would not have occurred had these nations been able to afford to invest in building water and sanitation systems instead of servicing their burdensome debt. Health spending per person average is less than $10 a year throughout Africa. The most recent drug treatment therapies for AIDS cost between $10,000 to $15,000 per year. So it comes as no surprise that AIDS is now the number one killer in Africa. One in five African children dies before the age of five. One third of all African children are malnourished. More than half of Africa's adults are illiterate. And the average adult has only three years of formal education. This is what happens when governments are forced to spend 40% of their budgets in servicing an unjust and unpayable debt. Instead of investing in health care, clean and safe water, and education for the people. The reason I say that this is part of the unfinished business of the abolitionist movement is because the litany of Africa's suffering ultimately derives from the Atlantic slave trade and the colonial exploitation of Africa. If Africa was justly compensated for the labor and wealth that was plundered from her shores during the slavery and colonial exploitation eras. The debt could be paid many times over. Yet there has never been any significant attempt by Western Europe or the United States to rectify the injustices that Africa has suffered. In 1961, Kwame Nkrumah illuminated the path to Africa's liberation 
when he said, for centuries, Europeans dominated the African continent. The white man arrogated to himself the right to rule and be obeyed by non-white. His mission, he claimed, was to civilize Africa. Under this cloak, the Europeans robbed the continent of vast riches and un inflicted unimaginable suffering on the African people. He continued, all this makes a sad story, but now we must be prepared to bury the past with its unpleasant memories and look to the future. All we ask of formal colonial powers is their goodwill and cooperation to remedy past mistakes and injustices and to grant independence to the colonies of Africa. In the quote, Kwame Nkrumah's challenge still echoes in the conscience of humanity, but there has never been even minimal economic atonement for the massive destruction wrought by slavery on the people of Africa and African Americans. I believe that African Americans are also suffering as a part of the intergenerational effects of slavery, of the slavery era. And I do support some form of reparations to African Americans. Yet even the few affirmative action programs in place are under constant assault. Reparations for African Americans is also a part of the unfinished business of the abolitionist movement. But it is a difficult issue, and it must be carefully addressed. With respect to the issue of Africa's unpayable debt, however, our course of action is more clear and urgently compelling. We must build a nationwide consensus for the cancellation of Africa's debt. And I think the modern abolitionist movement should play a leadership role in this effort. I know that the American anti-slavery group is being challenged to support a wide variety of human rights movement. And there are many different forms of slavery, such as the domestic enslavement of women in <coughs> Afghanistan, which also merits your attention. But the suffering throughout Africa is so massive, and yet so preventable. And so I appeal to you today to make the debt bondage of Africa one of your leading priorities and to help us build a coalition to cancel debt. Whether we are talking about debt bondage in Africa or the purchase and sale of human beings in Mauritania or the exploitation of prison labor almost everywhere, I think we have to consider the underlying spiritual vacuum that enables slavery in the 21st century. What is this moral blind spot that makes it possible for one group of human beings to treat another with such arrogant contempt? It is too easy to say that it is all about greed and money or tribalism, although that is part of it. The common denominator among slaveholders everywhere is psychological denial and a lack of moral leadership their lives. The top religious leaders of every major faith agree that slavery is wrong in all of its ugly forms. Yet somehow the message never reaches the soul of the slave master. Even though he or she may go to worship services every week, sadly all too often we find that religious leadership and moral leadership are not always one and the same. That was true when the churches attended by slave masters in the antebellum South. And it is true today in the mosques attended by slave traders in Sudan. We must find a way to show the slaveholders that they too are bound by the chains of slavery. And the lash that scars the slaves back cuts also, also into the souls of the slave masters. We must find a way to make them understand that slavery denies the humanity of the perpetrator as well as the victim. We have to challenge religious leaders of all faiths to 
make opposition to slavery more of a priority. And even more importantly, the practice of enslaving another human being must be made a grievous sin in the eyes of the community. With this commitment and with increasing economic sanctions against nations that tolerate slavery, I believe we can begin to put an end to the slave trade in Northern Africa and the more sophisticated forms of enslavement that we find in so many other places. Now, Dr. Jacobs, nothing that I have said about the need to address Africa's debt knowledge in any way diminishes the magnitude of your outstanding contribution to the modern anti-slavery movement. I am personally inspired by your tireless dedication to alleviate the oppression of chattel slavery in North Africa. With your co-founders of the American anti-slavery movement, Mohammed and Athi and David Chand, you have reawakened America's conscience and our moral responsibility to take action to eliminate slavery wherever it is practiced. You have lobbied Congress and the United Nations for sanctions to help end slavery, and it is encouraging that your efforts resulted in a cut in the U.S. foreign aid to Mauritania. And I know you have also spoken out on behalf of women and children forced into sexual slavery in Thailand and other nations exploited children in the sweatshops of Asia and migrant agricultural workers who are forced to endure shameful living conditions even in our own country. It is no easy thing to confront the global challenge of slavery and to address the never-ending stream of reports of enslavement and brutality that come to your office from every continent. Yet, with courage and tenacity, you have picked up the torch of liberty and enkindled new light that now shines in the once dark corners where such inhumanities went unreported for too long. Your efforts have given a powerful voice and new hope to the victims of this festering injustice. And I join everyone together in saluting you. Dr. Jacobs, would you please come to the podium? May I have an email?